Welcome back, everybody. We are going to resume. We will, uh, Linda, I think this will be possible for us to have a couple of handheld mics that we can walk around. And um, that will make it uh, easy for, uh, for you to uh, speak into a mic and let everybody hear you. And if, uh, if for some reason that doesn't work out and um, you blurt out your question before you have a mic or something of that sort, um, we'll have our uh, lecturer repeat the questions. Thanks so much, Dave. Am, am I back on, Linda? Are we functioning? You hear me okay? Wonderful. Okay, while we're wrestling with the microphones for just a second, I did want to mention one other thing about Latin America, is that if we use Latin America as uh, truly the phrase for anyone in the Western Hemisphere speaking whose primary uh, language was a romance, romance language, then of course that would have meant that a good chunk of Canada would have been in Latin America. <laughs> it came back yeah. well, you know, so, that, so Again, you have to be a little careful about what that means exactly. So we have, we have microphones here, should I? You want me to do this? Or do you have to walk around? Very short question. Okay. Oh, yeah. Short question. Okay. Here comes the mic. So everybody can hear. Sorry. Thanks. Hi, I'm just wondering why they're both called America. Is that the same thing? Why they're both called America? Why, why both North and South America? Yeah, how that happen? Oh, okay. This is Amerigo Vespucci, who's an important early Italian map maker. Um, who also winds up on uh, at least one expedition to what becomes the, Am the Amazon base, essentially. And this is uh, Vespucci, I think, sailed in 1504, and his, his was, the, was the, a key early map of the coastline being discovered, and that's the one that the king and queen of Spain wind up associating with this you know, whole new discovery and they wind up, others could have been called Columbia, right, if it been for Columbus, and said it winds up becoming America instead. And America also is a, I mean, Columbia is a pretty enough word, but America has a particularly lovely kind of lilt to it. That's one of the, I mean, regardless of how you feel about America or Americans or any of that's politics. I mean, linguistically, it rolls off the tongue. And so, you know, I think part of it is, you know, it has a kind of nice feel to it, whereas the United States is pretty choppy. You know, doesn't kind of do doesn't doesn't uh, invite the same linguistic smoothness. All right, another here we go. Yeah, yeah. What's your take on this emerging theory? There was actually the Chinese who discovered the Americas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, good. So uh, that's a lot. I had a little line in my, my notes that to talk about that and didn't quite have time. Um, this is the pre fourteen ninety two question. And if you think back to the map I showed you about human uh, movement over time, migration, and you see that pattern, you have uh, extraordinary uh, e achievements of ocean-going canoeists and sailors who were exploring from East Asia into Southeast Asia, and then on out to Hawaii and down into Tahiti and the rest of the Society Islands and all the rest of the islands of the South and Central Pacific. And it's, it's an amazing story of travel with very, what seemed to us not as sophisticated large ships as we would expect for that kind of travel, which is just an amazing thing. But the evidence of actual Chinese explorers, we don't have it. I mean, the real problem is we don't have it. We don't, it's possible. We, but we don't, I mean, in California, we've got Fort Ross is still there. We know the Russians got there, 1812. It's a lot later. But in other words, it's, some, it's really a question of evidence. And I don't think the evidence is real good on this. There is another piece of this, though, that is interesting, and that is that the Chinese, and this is part of the story behind your question, I think, the Chinese had developed, they were a much larger and more sophisticated country and, and naval force and economy than any other country in the world in the 1400s, on up to well into the 1700s, and there's arguments about exactly when the West begins to surpass China by various measurements. But in the early 1400s, the Chinese are building very large ocean-going ships that were five times as large as Columbus's ships. Instead of 80 or 85 feet, they were 400-some feet. I mean, they were huge. And they were using these primarily for coastal exploration into the uh, Indian Ocean and on the African East Coast. 
So there is a clear pattern in the first two decades, 1400s and 1410s, uh, of that 15th century of the Chinese um, taking a kind of European exploratory approach to sort of figuring out what's where and who we can trade with and how to make money out of this and how to show Chinese cultural dominance and military force and all that sort of stuff. And it's, uh, it's, there's this weird thing that happens where Cheng Ho, who's this admiral, he's a eunuch and he's an admiral, uh, in the, he's the, 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 the dominant admiral in the Chinese Imperial Navy, he, in combination with the, the emperor, make a decision. They make a, a sort of collective decision at the top of the government to quit doing this. They sort of walk away from it. They quit building the ships. They quit sending ships out. On, they just kind of decide. They figured out what they wanted to know about the Indian Ocean. It wasn't that interesting. They already knew most of it by trade routes on land. They had issues they wanted to focus on at home. And ultimately, behind that, it appears, and I'm not a Sinologist, a Chinese historian, a specialist. But my sense of this is that ultimately there's a kind of cultural way in which the Chinese with their long-standing middle kingdom identity, that they're kind of like Americans think of themselves as the most important nation in the world. Chinese had long thought of themselves as the most important nation in the civilized world, as they saw Asia. You know, And they called themselves the middle kingdom. And everything came to them. And they sort of took a decision to focus back home. That they, didn't, they weren't that interested in. They, they walked away from what could have been a Chinese, uh, you know, they, they, the Americas could absolutely have been Chinese. I mean, that, that would be the other way to think about it. Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned several times when we intervened in uh, Latin America. Yeah. But you really didn't get into too much about the political implications of the Monroe Doctrine. How yeah. effective was that, in your opinion? Did it change history to a certain extent? Uh, OK, oh, good, good. There's a long history to the Monroe Doctrine. I think the most important thing I wanted to suggest was that the 80 years from 1823 to 1904, 81 years are really a period in which the United States only slowly gets the ability to have any kind of meaningful capacity for enforcing that, for actually shaping Latin American politics and its economics. And in those years, from the 1820s to 1900, the British, I mean, are really the dominant investor and the dominant outside military force. They're the country that shapes Latin American history more than any other after independence, 1823, essentially. Um, for the rest of Latin America from 1823 up to the 1890s. And the US and the, and the British actually have a couple of face-offs over Venezuela in the 1890s where they almost go to war with each other. And they're, try they're basically kind of, they look like football players, you know, kind of doing one of those one-on-one -on -one drills. They're kind of like, who's going to control this area? And the British are more worried that they, they're by far the dominant naval force in the world and they project power better than anybody in the 1890s. But the Americans are building their first blue water fleet in the 1880s and 1890s. And, they be, and, and Roosevelt sends them around, the Great White Fleet, he calls it, because it was painted white, sends them around the world on this tour in 1907, 1908. And, and that is a kind of demonstration of that power. But they're building that capacity. And the British are watching the Americans and trying to figure out, are they, are they really a potential enemy or a potential ally of ours? And the British are concerned about controlling their own empire, which is global. You know, the sun never set on the British Empire and all that. Uh, and also, they're concerned about the French, and they're really concerned about the Germans. I mean, the Germans are really the threat for them. They're worried that Germany, with its big natural resource base, and it, I don't mean to go on too long about this. Sorry, I get excited. But this is the, the big, big, large population. That Germany, with its outward growth after unifying in 1870, will be the future great power of the continent and threaten British interests around the globe. That's what they're worried about. And so then, in light of that, the Americans look less like a rival and more like a potential ally. And so they decide over Venezuela to kind of walk away and let the, let the Americans increasingly dominate the region. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. We get, and then there's one up here next time. Up, up here, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, why did the Mayan civilization collapse, and what did environmental degradation have to do with it? <laughs> well, you know, the great thing is we have an expert here on that, and so, Dave, you're on. You're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a great question. I know little about about Mayan history, and so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pass on that. Not because it's not important. That's, I, let me just emphasize, that's a great question, and, I, and I just, I'm not confident to answer it. Yeah. I'd like to ask you about Venezuela. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the New York Times reported on Venezuela today, yeah. saying that 
the Maduro regime is mm -hmm. kind of failing, mm -hmm. and therefore American capitalists, the petroleum companies, are buying the Venezuelan oil. Right. So Venezuela, under a Marxist regime, is becoming, in a corrupt kind of way, mm -hmm. capitalist. Mm -hmm. Can can you talk a little <laughs> bit about that? God, that's a great question, and and very articulately cast. Uh, yes, it, in a very corrupt way. Um, I mean, it, what you see is the power of the marketplace in action, and and the failed and limitations and failures of the efforts at socialism, you know, that Maduro and uh, his predecessor, Hugo Chavez, had tried to pull off in an era of, of capitalist domination. I mean, 1945 was the right moment to try that. <laughs> Historically, I mean, that's when, that's when there's a huge experiment in socialism around the globe. Democratic socialism in Scandinavia, you know, labor government socialism with the National Health Service in Britain, you know, the, there's, there's the Chinese Revolution creating a communist regime, the Russians are now a great, in, 1945 was the big turn to the left in world politics. But by 1989, and the Soviet Union collapses, and the, and the Chinese quit pretending to be communist in any meaningful way, and Vietnam also becomes a, a kind of state capitalist economy, and, and basically communism disappears. That, that, that's the moment, not long thereafter, that you have the Venezuelan Revolution, which is sort of a historically poorly timed, I guess is the way to say it. And, and it's, not that, it's not that their efforts to create a more just, egalitarian Venezuelan society were wrong or, or immoral or, or, or sort of dumb, dumb in some way, so much as that it was just terribly timed because the rest of the globe was shifting toward using market mechanisms to produce more, to sort of expand pies rather than to redistribute them. That's, that, that becomes the overwhelming logic during the Reagan years, the Thatcher years, the 1980s especially. It really happens in the 70s. That's why I wrote that book about the 70s. It was mostly about that issue. So it's a, it's a great question. And the internal stuff about Venezuela when I was in high school in the mid-70s, one of my better friends there was a young woman from Venezuela, and it, it was fantastically wealthy. I mean, Venezuela, you know, it has the largest oil reserves in the world, but the problem is that it's relatively heavy, and the crude, it's difficult to access without a lot of expertise, and their rejection of the international oil corporation's dominance of their system led to a deterioration of the essentially of the pumping facilities. And that's what the Iranians have also been experiencing under the sanctions. Um, and what happens in Venezuela has been a tragic, I mean, what goes on in Venezuela is so tragic. And the fault is everywhere. I mean, God knows the regimes have plenty of responsibility. Certainly the sanctions put on them from outside have not helped. Oil companies have extracted an amazing amount of wealth out of there. So, you know, what, what you see now I think is the, the dysfunction, what the Times is reporting just this week is really the effort to you know, how do we stay alive? I mean, this is really, because I mean, the Maduro regime is really, I mean, times are hard, really hard. And the problem with sanctions, of course, is they always hit the, the people you don't really want to hit. They hit the working people who are the l most vulnerable. They don't hit the elites who, you, who other nations are trying to sanction. It's the elites always survive in those situations and instead extract wealth, you know, what's left. They'll figure out some way to do it. They'll even hire, I think they hired Dutch, was it which is it Shell and I, I forget if it was Exxon. It's not Exxon. It's one. Maybe it's Mobil. They, they've they've actually got these little sort of non-contract contracts with these people to come and start pumping oil enough so that they can get enough money to remain in power. So it's deeply cynical at one level, but it's also parallel to what goes on in Iran, which is a deeply impoverished country now, but the but it doesn't actually threaten the government until the very end. That's the that's the tragic crunch on sanctions, which Dave knows a lot more about than me, but I won't ask him. Yeah. <laughs> the last speaker in this series is going to focus on Venezuela. Great, great, excellent. Yeah. So, as a good high school student, I learn about American history focused only on the U.S. I don't learn about Canada. Uh, if I learn about Mexico, it's because I have a friend whose family is from Mexico. Yeah. I don't learn anything about any other country hardly at all. Yeah. Is that parallel in in South and Central America, if I live in Brazil, do I, is American history only about Brazil? And mm -hmm. if I live mm -hmm. in Chile, is it only about mm -hmm. Chile? Or do they have a little bit more integration between the countries than they do are cognizant of their neighbors? <laughs> oh boy, that's a terrific question. And you know, I don't know enough about the history departments 
in Latin American universities to be confident, fully confident, but I have a pretty good guess. And that is that every country who has history departments that I've ever visited or even just looked at their rosters of and looked at the books of are wildly disproportionately interested in their own national history. <laughs> and, and the best recent example of this to me was when I went out and gave a talk at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, uh, where a former graduate student of mine um, from Cornell days is, is now the chair of the department and a senior professor there, which makes me feel really old. But, uh, but he's, he said, I said, so what's the distribution? What do people teach up here? What do they study? What do they write books on? And he says, he says, well, you know, there are two of us are Americanists. You know, this is Victoria is like, I mean, they look right at Port Angeles. They look right at the United States. Their students are incredibly conscious of American culture. And so they're, they're right there. And they, were, they have two Americanists in a department of about 20 or 25 people. And, and everybody else, they've got a few Europeanists and one Asianist maybe, maybe one other. And basically everybody does Canadian history. You know, which is great, because like you say, Americans don't, we don't, it isn't just high school, even in college we don't take any, Amer any Canadian history. I remember at Duke as a grad student, I saw they had a Canadian studies program, and I was like, I'd love to take that, I don't know anything about Canada, you know. I asked my advisors, and they said, oh, no, you don't want to do that, that'll distract you, you know, you don't want to stay on this American, I remember thinking, oh, okay, well, I mean, I felt kind of, you know, anyway, so I think, I think the answer is yes, the, the, the attention to self is extraordinary. Texas is another great example where they require you in the universities down there to take either U.S. history or Texan history. Texas history, they would call it, Texas history. Um, you have, in other words, that qualified. You can take Texas history, that counts as equal to American history, which is, you know, it's Lone Star Republic. I mean, they, you know, they sort of, you know, and it's kind of, I mean, I don't know, you could, there are good arguments for every, every version, I guess, but increasingly U.S. history, as we study it, write it, and teach it in the United States, is, is incredibly transnational. I mean, all of, all, everything I've ever written or done any serious research on is always about how the U.S. connects to the rest of the world, how it compares to other countries, you know, what the, the flows of people and exchanges of ideas and money and all the rest of it, culture between them. So it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, about three years ago, I spent some time in Chile uh -huh. in uh, Valparaiso, and yeah. I visited a museum, and I'd heard a little bit about this, but it had um, information that had been uh, declassified um, about correspondence with the CIA and the in their involvement in the um, yeah. overthrow of Allende. Yes. And I, I wondered if you, um, I guess, should could share a little bit about what you know about the CIA's involvement yeah. with sure. that. Sure, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, in uh, uh, Salvador Allende, who was a physician by training and a, and a democratic socialist, cap I mean, underlying democratic part of this, is elected in 1970 in a sort of, in an election that Americans had heavily invested in his opponents, the Christian Democrats, and had expected him to lose. And they were really stunned. The CIA had run a pretty extensive funding operation to make sure that Allende didn't get elected. And when he got elected anyway, this really enraged the top level of the CIA and Nixon himself and Kissinger, who Nixon's the president, Henry Kissinger at that point is a national security advisor. Later he'll also be secretary of state. It's a rare combination where he does both. And they both, the Nixon administration um, really lights up about this. They're, what they're worried about in Chile is they see this as another Castro, as another Cuba. They're very concerned about the, the opening, uh, the development of a, a viable, successful socialist government of some kind in the hemisphere that might be further from the U.S. and maybe then less repressive. I mean, one of the reasons the U.S. Is, was so persistent in its attacks on the Castro regime was to make sure that the Castro regime became as extremist as it could, right? I mean, if you can, if you can provoke your opponents long enough, you can make them more like the cartoon you pretended they are to begin with. Um, you know, I mean, they're not dumb in the CIA, nor are they in any other large country's covert operations arm. I mean, all countries do this. It's not unique to the, I'm not in any way suggesting the U.S. is unique, but the U.S. is the one who was doing it in Chile. So they spend the next three years funding an opposition. Um, and, and most of it's based in the military, but they also, uh, what they're really concerned about is the model of nationalization. It's the same issue that was true in, uh, with the United Fruit Company in Guatemala. It's the same issue that was true in Iran in 1953 on the oil, the nationalization of the oil holdings there uh, that had been held by the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company and which were, were nationalized in, in 1951. And the US, with British pressure, helps to run this coup against the elected uh, democratic regime of Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran in 1953. And then in Chile, the issue is copper would be the simple way to say it. It's the Anaconda Copper Company. 
Um, you may know that name from Montana, right, where much of their domestic uh, operations are based. Um, so they're very concerned about, the, again, the model of taking property which is foreign owned, American owned, you know, and they spend those three years weakening the economy and making the economy scream was the term that Kissinger used. He said, that's what we want to do. We want to hurt Chile. We want to hurt Chileans until they overthrow this guy and get rid of them. And we're going to help do that. We're going to fund people inside the military and promote this operation by squeezing the economy, reducing support for the government, building up dissidents inside the military, and eventually they owe the military with huge American assistance, overthrows Allende and, and kills him at the presidential palace in a gunfight in 1973. Which leads to the, the dictatorship of uh, Augusto Pinochet, and Pinochet was a how do I say this in a neutral historical way? He was a man with an extraordinary record of human rights abuses, I guess would be the way to put it, uh, and a ferocious authoritarian. I mean, just, and the number of disappearances, the number of torture cases that, came, that happened under Pinochet, particularly in the early years from 73 to 75 or 76, those were, it was a horrendous record. And the US has a lot of that blood is on CIA hands because they helped, they absolutely put, helped put Pinochet in power. This is not to say that Allende's government was completely popular. He won election with a plurality, not a majority. He had all kinds of issues and problems inside the Chilean economy that he had to manage. It was hard to manage it because of the outside opposition from the U.S., but it would have been hard to manage it anyway. So it's hard to know what would have happened without U.S. Uh, involvement there. I mean, that's the problem with any of these uh, cases of decisions made. Somebody at the break was suggesting that the importance of historical decisions and how they could have been made in other ways. If the US hadn't been involved in Chile, Chilean history would have absolutely been different and there would have been a lot less killing in the 1970s and 1980s, but we don't know exactly what would have happened. You know, counterfactuals are really hard to figure out, but we have to think about them because if you don't think about counterfactuals, what could have happened had somebody made a different decision, then we're just acting like it's all, sorry for the word, teleology, it's all destiny. We're headed toward the present, and there was no option on the way here, right? There, there was nothing but to create global warming. No way around that, you know, which, which would be ridiculous, because, of course, you could make other decisions along that, that path, not just on global warming. I mean, on any particular issue. So it's a great question. I think, I think I successfully dodged it pretty well there, didn't I? <laughs> I mean, do we do Chile this week? Do you get somebody doing Chile in this series? No? Next series. Next time we do Latin. We have 10 weeks. We do it, yeah. Great, great. I have a question for yeah. you. With the, the number of people that are coming from Central America to the United States, mm -hmm. you look at their, their governments of mm -hmm. those countries and you say to yourself, well, do we really want our people to go somewhere else? Because those people are viable to us and you know, they're there to help the country, their specific country grow. So you know, am I looking at it wrong or is it uh, we'll go there because you can have a better life and we're not going to stop you and it's no big deal. So you're talking about the Honduran government here? Or I'm talking Nicaragua about government? all yeah. Central America, Guatemala, yeah. Honduras, uh, El Salvador, mm. Mm. Mexico. Yeah. You do have somebody doing Central American Next stuff week. coming in, so they'll have a much better answer to this. Um, but certainly the interests of those regimes varies a lot, but they have their political opponents and they're happy to see political opponents leave, happy to push them out. Um, uh, they have their strong historic patterns of racial discrimination towards indigenous peoples in particular who wind up being a particularly s suffer more than anyone else um, disproportionately at the hands of the drug wars and also political repression from those governments. Um, so, you know, to some extent they're happy to have these people leave that they're not, they don't have to be responsible for them, they don't deal with the, manage their, their dissent. Um, and also I think, I mean, I did show you that slide about global warming and the extremity of, of what's happening to the farming uh, potential, the agricultural outputs in Central America is really grim. It's not a happy story. And so for people trying to make a living, it's more and more difficult to do so. So there's relative overpopulation, I suppose, in that sense. Although that's always a judgment to call something overpopulation implies that you couldn't manage those people. And I'm not at all sure that that's true. But from a government's point of view in Tegucigalpa or in Managua or something, it may look that way. Yeah, that's a great question. I hope you ask the person who comes from Central America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe David or Dick know the answer, but I was wondering, I, I didn't learn until relatively recently how successful Argentina was at one time. Great. Uh, uh, so great. prosperous, and then they had their socialist mm -hmm. implosion. Yeah. 
And I, I would hope we might have some discussion somewhere along the way on that. And, and I would c welcome any comments yeah. that you might have with the Perones and so on. Yeah, this is a great, it's a great question about Argentina's history, which I'm not an expert in at all. Um, but it is true that from uh, a European point of view and from a sort of global economic point of view, in the 1800s, it was not at all clear that the United States would necessarily be so much larger as an economy and as a nation than Argentina. Um, which looked, if you think about their um, topographies and their uh, rainfall patterns and the amount of fertile land that they have for agriculture, and if you think also about where they are in relationship to the temperate zone and the torrid zone, that they're in mild uh, terrain, both of them. And this is why we see so much wine, for example, from Argentina and Chile, right? I mean, this is uh, this is a very uh, sort of neo-European climate, as they sometimes refer to that, that. And so Argentina was quite successful in lots of ways. Their politics didn't wind up being as successful as that of the United States, at least in terms of organizing a powerful, unified nation that moved into industrialization with the same success that the U.S. had. And I say success in the sense of measuring out economic outputs, how you feel about that, crushing of labor strikes, all the sort of the, the, the costs that go along with industrialization, you know, you could, that's a very complicated big story. Yeah, so Argentina is much smaller than the US in population, and that would not have been predicted to be quite the way it, it worked out. Now, I guess the other theory, I could just say that the Andes are taller than the Rockies, but, uh, but that, would, that, would, that would also, that's not, that, there's, it's not just geography, yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, uh, most of your talk, which is wonderful, uh, is still centered on European-based identities. And from a historian's perspective, mm. how path-determinate do you think mm. various indigenous peoples have been mm. in the way mm. things played mm. out? Mm. As an example, mm. the Choctaw's successful repelling of De Soto's move mm -hmm. up yeah. the Mississippi, yeah. Yeah. as an example. Yeah, no, great question. And I had a very good and strong uh, dissent on this point uh, at the break, which I took very seriously. And that is that, you know, I breezed over an awful lot of indigenous history, right? Slavery just kind of blew right by. Well, if you want to go read my books, you'll see that they're mostly focused on issues of equality and justice and non-white peoples. Um, but in this case, that, that wasn't what I spent as much time on as I should have. So the question is excellent. Um, what you have is a long pattern of intense resistance um, by indigenous peoples to both fend off European invasions and then manage them when they're unable to completely defeat them and then retreat and negotiate with and intermarry with and model on in the case of the Cherokee, you know, and fight to the death in other places and, you know, in various ways people respond in, in ways to try to stay alive. In Latin America, demographically it's more successful and that's an interesting question that I don't feel competent to answer, at least not briefly, because there are parts of Latin America, if you think about it, this would have been a point I should have made clear earlier that Latin America's demography, I suggest that it's not a race, Latin Americans are not a race, because there's huge racial, and again, races in quotations, racial diversity within Latin America. And um, some parts of it, like uh, Chile, you know, are heavily European. I mean, and if you walk around the streets of you know, Santiago or something, you might think you were in Rome or something. You know? but, but if you're in other parts, as uh, people have mentioned, in Ecuador, in, uh, uh, in Bolivia in particular, or Guatemala, you know, you'll see much larger <coughs> indigenous populations. And that's a, that's a whole interesting question about how they've managed to survive and even thrive in some ways under ferocious ongoing repression, uh, which goes well through the 20th century and into the 21st century in a lot of these places. So, and Americans sort of understand that in the broad sense that we think of, you know, Mexico as sort of a, a mestizo country. So we get that there's a kind of blending of indigenous peoples and European heritage. But of course, that's true in the United States and in Canada as well. We just, it's just, we just see it more rapidly in certain parts of, of Latin America, not in Argentina, which also looks very European. I mean, it looks like, again, it looks like Rome. I mean, Buenos Aires thinks of itself as sort of being like another Rome. So it's a great question. And uh, I, hope, I think you've got somebody, the last person in this series is talking about indigenous peoples in Latin America, right? Not the last, but in the middle of the series, okay. we'll have a speaker on indigenous people, and she'll have a very broad scope. So there you go. Good. Next week is Central America, and after that, I forget the exact sequence, but uh, we will have a speaker on indigenous peoples, one on Venezuela, who will probably draw parallels to Argentina, probably, and uh, Brazil. And what am I leaving out, Jack? Mexico. Mexico, of course. Uh, Central America, Mexico, indigenous peoples, 
Brazil, and Venezuela. That's the lineup for the series. Thank you very much for that reminder. And thank you oh, yeah. for a wonderful right. start right. to the series. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.